Hello, hey, Cavus, right? Is that Ryan? Yeah, nice to meet Hi. you. Hi. Well, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for uh, agreeing to talk to me about well, whatever <laughs> my podcast. I like, I like talking about whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> Especially now. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll start off. I'll start off by asking the really important question I would ask any English person, which is, you don't like the clash? Uh, do you know what? Yeah, I, I'm so glad you posted that, actually, because I'm, I'm not here to, uh, you know, I don't like to rubbish uh, any bands, but God, especially for, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm like 49 now, and but particularly okay. a few years older than me. They were just like one of the British sacred cows, you know. You just can't not like the Clash, and yeah, I really like I really like Tommy Gunn. I think it's, I really love Tommy Gunn, but you know, you know what's that's really funny. Have... You know what's really funny. I would I would always tell anybody because I've had forty years. I'm like five years older than you, because I think you're almost fifty, right? Yes, yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah, this year. So I'm fifty five. And like, I've had almost 40 fucking years to rectify this situation. But like, I always tell people, I like the first 20 seconds of Tommy Gun, like, and then when it goes, you know, I, yeah, it, it seems like, um, and then when I put that up there, because I've gotten so much shit, and this has nothing to do with the clash as people. And obviously they're a good band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that the Clash are horrible or that people should have their heads examined, but they just seem like such a sacred cow. And it, it's, that cartoon was more for people that just cannot believe that you could possibly not like the Clash. I mean, I, I think less so now, but, but it like, used to be. Like it's, it's completely unheard of. And everything else and, and everything, Everything else that came out of that era, out of England and beyond, whether it's fucking the Sex Pistols album or Wire, of course, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. the first three Wire albums, or fucking the Stranglers or X-Ray Specs, every other band, I'm like, yeah, but the Clash, I, I just don't get it. I, 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 I've tried. There's a couple songs here and there, and I, I just don't fucking get it. So the cartoons not really for the Clash. It's for people that just cannot believe that you can't possibly think that they're the greatest fucking band in the world. I don't get yeah, it. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, um, it used to be a lot worse a few years ago, particularly the British music press. You, you just, you know, the Clash were always seen as this kind of like, you know, righteous kind of, uh, kind of band. Uh, but now I think that, you know, now that the whole, uh, less so now because the whole rock and roll thing's over now, you know, it's a <laughs> it's kind of history, it's a history thing. You know, it ended, it ended in about like, you know, the early 2000s, it was like, you know, Don Caviero put out American Dawn and then rock and roll was over. It was like, you know, that was that. But, uh, oh, you like, <laughs> you like Don Caviero, huh? Hmm. Yeah, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I mean, yeah. I just picked out that album as a, as a, as a, a you know, but. Sure, sure. I, I wish it weren't over. You know, I've invested my entire life in it. You know, I'm still, I'm just like the, it's like the, um, it's like rock and roll is now like the, the party where, all that's left are the people on coke talking shit, but it's still the party. So I'm just like, you know, I'm just holding on, <laughs> holding on yeah. to the remains of it. Yeah, I, I don't get it. I, and, and then there's some other things like when I was a kid, because I came out of like sort of a, when I was a kid, I was really into hard rock and heavy metal. I mean, that that was just my, same, I, wasn't a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't an art student that liked the clash you know i i liked fucking uh yeah. i liked kiss and cheap trick and then queen and iron maiden and, and judas priest unleashed in the east and that kind of stuff that's kind of what i grew up with so like i mean the clash just compared to iron maiden killers it just i don't need to hear the clash i got iron maiden killers you know i got i got that stuff you know so like well you know the you know the funny thing I was going to say, the funny thing for me is I came online in 1980. So this is where, you know, the music sort of started for me in 1980. Um, and uh, and so then I had to work backward to punk. So at first, and if you think about it, the, way, the, 
the way it was in the 80s, because I grew up, like I say, it came online in 80, and the way it was with sort of production and stuff is that, you know, music would be, the, the sound of records would be changing every sort of six months. So stuff sure. that had come out even two or three years earlier sounded pretty old. So I remember it took me a while. It took me about two or three listens to get my Buzzcocks ears because it kind of sounded old at first to me. And, um, but, you know, and, you know, so I had to work backwards to punk. And the same thing with, funny enough, Black Sabbath, who are one of my favorite bands. It took me a while to really kind of get my head around Bill Ward's the way he tuned his drums. It sort of, it sort of sounded like he hadn't tuned his drums properly. It took about three or four listens before the Black Sabbath coin dropped. So it was always sort of working backwards with punk, um, which was funny. But uh... yeah, I mean, like uh, there, I, I had to learn to like all that stuff later after I went through my Iron Maiden phase. In fact, yeah, yeah. Well, there's like things like I remember, like I used to read. Uh, there was a magazine in the States here called Cream Magazine that was a very pivotal magazine in the 70s, you know? Yeah, and they yeah. talked about stuff like the Stooges and the MC5, but I was still listening to, you know, uh, well, whatever. And I was totally into my Iron Maiden phase when I finally decided I was going to try to play the first Stooges record. And I remember like playing that and just going, well, this is just like the same thing over and over for three minutes. There's no yeah. solos, you know, the guy, it's just the, I didn't understand the brilliance of it because, uh, you know, because I was into things like Iron Maiden and, and um, you know, well, I, that I, kind of stuff. And I ended up being like a punk rock kind of kid. I, I was like a letter writer kind of guy in like the yeah. early 80s. Like, um, you know, if you wanted to know about stuff, you had to write letters to people. So that's what I did. And there was like a early heavy metal scene too that I kind of was aware of as well. And that was the stuff I, I uh, kind of got into. So I had to go back later and discover that I like, you know, the Stranglers or, uh, you know, whatever, Echo and the Bunny Men or, or, you know, the birthday party or just whatever. So that's my, so that explains my shitty attitude toward the Clash, I guess. Well, did you know, I mean, the thing was, Iron Maiden was my band. Um, they were my they they uh, they were my second band. I sort of fell in love. You know, my first thing was my first like the the world went three D with the Stray Cats. But when Run to the Hills came out, then then they were my band. And up until Seventh Son, until Cardiacs came along, really. Although there was late on into you know Slayer and you know and then also like Napalm Death and then also things like the, the Smiths and then Sonic Youth or whatever. But really, Iron Maiden was my band until Cardiacs came along. And it was the first band I ever saw. I saw, the first gig I saw was a World Slavery Tour, Power Slave. And um, I awesome. it was just, the uh, first time I ever, um, first time I ever performed was, was like doing a Lost for Words. In fact, me, do you know Rob Crow? Me and uh, Rob Crow did a Lost for Words cover last year. I just that? heard that. I, I just heard that, your acoustic cover of the instrumental from Power Slave. Yeah. That, I do have a Rob. Yeah, and, I, I and do. we did our mission for Harry as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, did, it did seems you like that one? Um, I, I heard Lost for Words, but I didn't hear anything else other than that. Oh, like, I literally well, came across it. I, I came across it two days ago. So mm. uh, we did uh, we did mission from Harry. Do you know that one? It's oh. the argument on oh. um, the B side of on Run to the Hill, and it was, it was a recording of an argument, mainly between Nico, Nico and Steve, and Bruce is sort of stirring it up, and they recorded it, and they put it out, it's like their Trogs tapes, and uh, me <laughs> and Rob, and well, Rob put it all together, me, Rob, and um, a guy called Mike Venart, who's a, a great musician, we, we redid that, and I was Nico, Rob's Bruce, um, and it's, it's <laughs> and then Mike's um, Steve, sort of thing, it's, but with, with our English accent, sort of thing. Right, right, well, I yeah, I knew about that because um, on some of the Iron Maiden DVDs, there's like a, they, you know, they put all these like documentaries and all their things, yeah, and they the talked early, about that. Yeah, 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 they, yeah. They, the early days, and they talked about that argument and how it was recorded and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I do actually know it. So, um, yeah, well, you strike me as somebody that likes a uh, huge, giant variety of music, much like oh, myself. Yeah, yeah. So, 
I kind of thought this would be a good conversation, but um, I'll tell you the reason why I, I um, the first reason I started to do this is because of the whole COVID thing from last year. And I had a book come out called Self and Punishment. And that came out last October. And I interviewed like 30 people and I'll send you a link or get, get a copy to you or whatever. But it's, it's about people that are kind of self-employed or just maybe kind partially self-employed or completely self-employed, whether they're musicians or artists or whatever. So I talked to all these people, everybody from people in the Melvins to, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, um, people in the, uh, the Descendants and um, um, some artist type people. Preach on, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that's why I started doing this because the book came out and I knew that because of the COVID stuff, I wasn't going to be able to really do much. So that's kind of why I've started to do this. And I've uh, interviewed a bunch of different people and I've gotten to the point now where I just, there's other people I would just like to talk to that maybe necessarily don't have anything to do with the book or the theme of the book, or whatever. But I, and I apologize for this ahead of time, but prim I primarily know you because you were the second guitar player from the, the last period of the cardiacs. But then in the last couple of days, after you said that you were willing to talk to me, I tried to do all this research and realized that you've been a very busy person for like 30 odd years. You know, from like Die Laughing, <laughs> Monsoon, Bassoon. And yeah. then I started playing all this stuff and I liked it instantly. And I was like, so you've been like, I guess, a musician, self-employed person for, I'm guessing, a long time? Like, well, I mean, well, I mean, I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I quit school when I was 16. And, um, you know, I, I, and I sort of, I was in a band, like a teenage band, sort of die laughing, and then kind of moved to London. But I mean, I've always, I'd always had to, well, I, mean, I mean, at first I was on, like, you know, um, like welfare, you had to do, to be a a musician that's what you had to do to be a, a full-time musician you know but, yeah. but but once i moved to london when i was when i was 21 um i grew up in the southwest of england in a place called plymouth like a sort of naval city but i moved to london when i was 21 and then you just okay you mainly since then sort of worked worked various you know various sort of part-time and day jobs and just been self-employed just in order just so you can just have you you know had to have music as a focus kind of thing right but then the, over the last over the last i'd say last three or four years things have got got to be that i stopped doing stopped doing my day job kind of thing and just was just focusing on music because i got sort of busy with things like gong and um playing with the steve hillage band and then also i've been djing as well just, just play, djing like freak music just crazy yeah. music but um, been doing that as well which has been at, at festivals and stuff so yeah it's been a, a sort of been just being a lifer i suppose but yeah, you, yeah. Find, you know, you know, it's like you have to find whatever way you can in between tours or in between gigs. You you got to work, you know. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I just like I've I've been self-employed for like uh, almost ten years now. But before that, I would I I would just work a job that I hated, like in a kitchen or something, and just I would have enough freedom yeah. to just like have yeah, a yeah, job yeah. to leave and then just go and do whatever. So I've had to like a year ago. Right now, I've had to just pour on the drawing and that kind of thing and uh surprisingly yeah. enough surprisingly enough people still seem to want artwork which is uh maybe not too surprising but i was kind of surprised um how has your how has your last year been as far as uh not being able to uh you know play shows or um get paid for playing shows or or going on tours or how have, have you has it been hard to get by or how are things going well well, what um, do you know? What it's been a, it's been quite. I've I've been really, I've been sort of quite lucky. Um, well, a let's just you know, I've been lucky enough to at least we you know live in a country for all for all the faults we might have with our with our government. At least to live in a country where you know people have been on self-employed people have been given some money, you know, to get by. Because I'm from Iran, and back in Iran, everyone's had to go back to work. Because they just there's just no money in the in the in the pot. They've had to go back to work, COVID or not, sort of thing. Right. Um, so I'm not, in that respect, I'm lucky. But also, I put out um, a solo album, which I was going to put out. You know, I was putting out anyway. 
in April, just to, just as the COVID thing happened. And I did it, it was on my own label and I was doing it all through Bandcamp. And I was lucky that that kind of tidied me over. I've been putting out sort of um, these limited edition releases with this other band I do called the Utopia Strong. And that's ended up tidying us over. We do these like sort of, actually I've got one here. Um, yeah, that's, that, that, let's see. <laughs> do these screen prints, which sort of do 250 of these. And it's sort of screen printed. I did it. I did like a screen, not screen print, sorry, lino cut cover. Oh, and nice. Then, which is really fun. So it's great being getting back into doing lino cutting again for the first time since I was sort of 16. And I've been right, doing, right. I've been drawing again and, and doing lino cuts, selling some art. So I've, and I did a online gig and did a sort of, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a donate button. So I've been, yeah, yeah. I've been kind of screen by. I mean, I don't think I can do an, another year of it, but um, yeah, I, I was okay. I feel I feel, I feel really fortunate, you know, given given how fucked some of my friends are. You know. We'll see what happens. You know, the vaccine slowly working its way, but I I don't think it's going to be any better anytime soon. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I mean, what's what's going to be kind of weird? I, I, I'm what, what I'm wondering about things like uh, even just kind of things like gigs is I, even when we've we've all had the vaccine or, or most people have had the vaccine. I really I wonder how people will feel about being in a in a room with loads of other people again, just all squashed together. Yeah, I mean, I in my head, I feel all right about it. You know, I, I wonder if people just will have got so used to kind of the social distancing and what have you that it's when when gigs come back if people will be different about it if they ever come back i don't know but um yeah that's a good question and 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 then the other thing i wonder about is if people will be nicer to each, nicer to each other because now they have the oh we can be next to each well, other maybe we should just be nice to each other and not worry about whatever yeah but, but who knows um do you mind if we've i ask worry, you we've been worried that for like Worrying about that for 45 years, but uh, yeah. about people yeah. being nicer to each other, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so if you don't mind, I was going to ask you a couple of cardiacs questions. Please, yeah, please, I mean, please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, like I said before, I was aware of you. Well, first off, the thing about cardiacs that I find the most interesting is like, it's this band that's been around for a long time and like nobody knows fucking anything about them unless you just happen to hear about them through somebody else and the melvins toured with napalm death and i got along with those guys fine and i think it was shane yeah shane's a, big, of, shane's a big fan, yeah. yeah he said that that's like his favorite band for, of all time yeah so, that's right yeah so i yeah, think yeah, between yeah between getting to know him and um, watching, um, I know his name isn't Chewy, but the guitar player for Voivod now, he always yeah, Chewy, yeah. A... Daniel, Daniel. Daniel. Daniel, yeah, yeah Daniel yeah. Bongre, yeah. Yeah, so between, between knowing Shane and seeing Daniel wearing um, the Cardiac shirt, I suddenly became aware of it. And then when I, it's just, the weirdness of just this band that's like probably the last the last band you could like go through a portal and worship completely through all their different phases and and i just as a listener i'm i'm just dumbfounded and for whatever i like all the periods but for whatever reason the periods i like the best are the period um with you playing second guitar and uh, those those uh, garage concerts, those recordings, and then the um, Sing the God record, you know? And then I hear this stuff and I'm just like, why do people not know about this? Because like, you know what it's like when you hear something that you like a lot and you're just, the first thing you think is, is where have I been? Where have I, why, why haven't I heard this stuff? Um, and you have the, you have the, uh, unique perspective of not only being in cardiacs but being a fan of cardiacs for years before before that why do people not know about cardiacs is there anything that because like every time i see videos of the cardiacs no matter what era there's tons of people watching them and 
am I making any sense? Like, why, why, why do they? No, no, you can you can make sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I just can't. Um, I don't. I mean, I it's, it's hard. It to, it's hard to know. I I came on. I came online with Cardiac. Actually, Cardiac and Voivod came into my life in the same year, nineteen eighty eight. Um, wow. And they were both. They 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 were both. I mean, the impact of those two bands probably more than anything else for me were, were, was uh but we, we can talk about voivod later because it's, it's a kind of, yeah, well, a of a parallel path to, yeah, to, we'll, to a degree but we'll get on the voivod later yeah but you know cardiacs was um i got turned on to um a little man in a house and a whole world window in 1988 and it had just come out and i was, I was 16 and a guy lent it to me uh, who i just met really which is amazing and and it was that thing of the moment I heard it, it was just like, oh my god, you know, where did you know? This is the, this is the best music I've ever heard. I mean, it was just like it was waiting for me to hear it. Yeah. And at that point, like you know, like like so, I mean, obviously being a complete music obsessive anyway. Like like so many people, I was always buying. I was buying Kerrang and NME, which is the two British papers, you know. Um, right, right. And I just thought, because because this was their, this was their debut album, and and because like like, like you, I'd never heard of them before. I didn't realise they'd been going since you know like the late seventies. I didn't realise that they were known to the music press already and stuff. I just thought yeah. this band, this is their debut album. They'd just come out and released this record. There's no information about the band on the back of the record. So I wrote to them and I wrote to them and said, the only other band that has done this has been Voivod. Da, 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 da. I got a lovely letter back from what I now realised was from Tim. But, um, and, and I was just, the letter I said, look, I, I, I want to read more about you. And, and I got sent this book of like press cuttings that they'd got. And uh, my feeling at the time as a 16 year old, not, not really knowing just how bad things were with the music press is I thought, well, it's only going to be a matter of six months to a year. And as soon as people know that this, the Cardex is going to be like, you know, as big as the Beatles sort of thing, or as, at least as big as the Stone Roses who are being talked about then. And then whenever I'd read a review of utter shit, or this band's terrible. And I was like, what? You know, and, and then it got to the point I'd be, I'd be playing them to people. And then they'd just be like, no, this is not for me and i i couldn't hear why people weren't hearing that this music was because because you know the, the, to me the music was like supernatural it was it was just like it just had something just that, that yeah. al almost nothing else had had it or, or at least you know occasionally you'll have a bit like there'll be a bit in a song and there might be that bit that goes okay well but, but that when that bridge it goes really fucking amazing and all funny colors appear and it goes all 3d and it's like, well, Cardiax does that bit all the way through. Like their whole album is that bit, that funny bit. And so right, I right. was like on this mad, you know, I was on this mad mission to, um, to, to convert everyone. And I managed to convert some people. And then the, the big thing was that then 1989 came along. The next year they put out On Land and In The Sea and Voivo put out Nothing Face. And for me, that was, it was just like, what a time to be alive because i think they're the two greatest rock and roll albums of all time <laughs> you know on, is on land in the sea and nothing face i mean and to be 17 years old and for these and they just completely sort of just rewired and then after the way i thought about music and then after yeah. that for a while at least i did you know i couldn't go back to sepultura or just, I, I had to go somewhere else then yeah i i, and, I know what you mean for, for for a little while, you know, and then it was all about like John Zorn's Naked City came out at this point, and then I got turned on to Captain Beefheart, like Trap Mask Replica, and then Frank Zappa, and then there was other stuff coming along like sort of you know Shudder to Think and No Me which, No, uh, and Melvin's of course, Shudder, you know. Which Shudder to Think uh, were you interested in? Just out of curiosity, because oh, I, I, I also in, I came in on I came in on Get Your Goat. But I think yeah. Pony Express record is the, the third wheel of On Landing in the Sea, Nothing Face, and Pony Express. I think that's the, the yeah. pyramid. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pony Express record is a great singular. That's their best record. And, um, you know, I, I guess it didn't do really very good. I saw them play a couple shows around that time, and they were amazing. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw them in London, yeah. They opened up 
one show for whatever reason after that period they open up for that band pavement do you know oh, yeah. and the, the audience the audience hated them and they um right, okay they 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 posed and you know they're kind of a feminine a feminine on stage and some people don't really like yeah, that yeah. and they just yeah, yeah. rose to the occasion to play a great you know the like guitar players doing all these mick ronson poses and people absolutely fucking hated yeah, them yeah 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 they yeah, were yeah. so good and um yeah they they were such a weird record such a strange um the way it's put together and everything and the singing and just um yeah i agree i was just curious because i saw that you like Sure to think so i had to ask about that and i i, I love that record yeah, too yeah. I, I think that's one of the best records from the 90s easily oh well, yeah it was uh, yeah just unbelievable so, but, so, so you know i was always nuts on cardiacs and of course that then started really feeding into the sort of music i was writing and playing and the other guitar player in the band dan um we were just getting more and more like that and i think it was less what the rest of the band wanted to do so yeah. at this point, you, you, the band kind of split up. And then to cut a, a bit of a long story short, we moved up to London. And st we had this new group called the Monsoon Bassoon, which was guys from um, down in Plymouth as well. And I wouldn't say it was it was like Cardiacs, because we, we, we were trying to work. We were always quite sort of um, fastidious about if anything sounded too much like something else. If something sounded too much like Shudder to Think or XTC or Cardiacs or you know, or Zappa, then we we sort of change it or dial it back a bit. But obviously the influences right. are all there. And then yeah. Tim Smith started coming along to our shows. Um, so I got to, you know, which is amazing. I mean, I met him a couple of times before at, at Cardiac's gigs, uh, but he started coming to our gigs. And then um, I kind of ran into one of the guys from the crew. Uh, this is in the early nineties, who'd moved quite near me here. And uh, so I was down the pub with him and I, we just got chatting, you know, got friendly and I just uh, needs a guitar. Couldn't get the way in, you know. And then about a week later I came back and I was doing a college course here and my girlfriend said, you're not going to believe this, you know, T Tim Smith just ran you and Cardiacs are touring with um, Chumbawamba and they're looking, they need a guitar tech. So right. I came, I came down, hung out, met them, and then, then I was on tour with them, and then, then I was in the bat, sort of in the gang, and there's no yeah. real difference with um, the only thing was by the time I eventually joined the band, it was it was no difference. The circle around Cardex is very close. There's no one really like employed because, like like an employee, it's just it's just a bunch of mates, and it's just Tim just wanted Tim just wanted to have all his mates around him, so yeah. then I was sort of part of that gang and. Um, then he produced, you know, he produced monsoons. He used to do our live sound for us, and you know, you know very, very close friends. And then, at the time in um, 2003, when John Paul was so busy with the Wild Hunt, and my band had split up at this point, so it was just like, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So. Yeah. So and then I had to learn like thirty six songs in about two or three months, which is pretty intense. But and and yeah, yeah. And those are and all the songs. Was, that's I joined the band. Yeah. And those were all the songs that that um he had written before nineteen eighty four. Yeah, yeah. It was it was everything up to the seaside. So yeah, and and then the the cassettes before that, you know, Toy World and the Obvious Identity. Um, and then, they, yeah, uh, it was all that stuff. Were, were those guys ever aligned with any, um, this is going to sound stupid, but um, I hear some like anarcho punk stuff occasionally in some of that music, like crass or rudimentary peni. Were those guys, I'm going to guess no, but were those guys ever interested in any of that stuff at all, as far as you remember? No, I don't think, well, no, no. I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't where Tim was at, but I mean, where Tim was at was just, um, well, like yourself, like most most people I know, um, just you know, have, having sort of big ears, just hearing, hearing music, you know, and yeah. I, I think no, no one, no one genre, in in the same as no one culture has any exclusivity over like visionary art or anything. I think no one genre has exclusivity over sort of 
visionary music. I mean, Tim just heard music. What it was, you know, heard music. Yeah, it was interesting, and it, he'd take it, you know, he'd take it on board and do something with it. So uh, while while I don't, you know, I never don't think he was. I know he's like, in terms of like, he liked a lot of punk stuff, and like you know he's into sort of Sex Pistols and stuff. But he was not like a, a big. He's not like a fan fan of, of things. I mean, I think he was you know, he's a big a big Zappa fan. He was a big fan of you know the Who was a big band for him, and then things like you know he's really into things like the Pixies, and then later on. He was really into sort of things like Deerhoof and Danielson family, and um, but you know mainly I uh, well, just got all stuff. I mean, Tim's big, big, just loves music, you know. Yeah, yeah. But um, and Gong, but but his main thing was he loved his mates' music. He was mainly, and we were very lucky. I mean, well, for whatever reason. Well, not for whatever reason. He he was like a magnet for loads and loads of um, oddball and interesting other other musicians and music. So yeah, yeah. there's always been like a real circle of artists and friends and bands around just around us lot. They always used to play with Cardiacs as well. So it's, yeah. it's kind of a, quite a, a groovy sort of scene that nobody's ever heard of, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not to... Um... take a turn for the worst or whatever, but um, since his uh, untimely passing not so long ago, I've noticed that all of a sudden now there's been more people either discovering Cardiacs or paying tribute to him and mm -hmm. the band in whatever yeah. phases. Um, do, you, do you get the sense that the... Um, I mean, and it, it, it's also sad that it would take that event for that sort of attention to happen. Have you noticed sort of like a upswell of people interested as oh, they've yeah, discovered? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, loads of people. I mean, what, what's been what's been so kind of strange about it is that um, God, how do how do I explain it? Um, so obviously, you know, there was this. You know what happened to Tim sort of 12, 13 years ago, when, when with his collapse and everything was, was just yeah. obviously a very, very. It, it was a personal thing because it's the thing that's it was the thing that was happening to you know our friend. So you're watching this thing happen to our, our friend, and for the first few years he was very, very private about it. Anyway, he didn't want anything really out there about what was going on, and was hoping that there would be some improvement. So yeah. this would be just you know, but, uh, and then for a while, cardiac stuff wasn't really available. Now I know it, so obviously some sort of level of um, cult was was growing, uh, probably. But I don't, you know, I don't keep my, um, I don't go to the like the fan pages or anything like that. I mean, it's just that I don't want my. No, it's it's really cool, but it's just that I want my memory of Tim to be like my memories of me and our friends have of him, and not, it's really cool that fans. But you sort of see people speculating or was he like this or what sort of anything well that's not how i want to think about tim you know sort of thing yeah so i hadn't really kept uh abreast of what what was you know going on obviously there would be quite a few benefit gigs and things which you play and you knew that there was people kind of getting into it um but then after he died then we there was that situation where he was trending on twitter he got to he got to be the number one thing on twitter and then there was even something about him in like I don't know if it was even New York Times or the Rolling Stone or something. They were all at Pitchfork and Vegan Brooklyn, Brooklyn Vegan, and yeah. that sort of thing would be writing about him. And it's like, hey, that's fucking hell. Even when before Tim was, you know, was ill, we just joke, oh, yeah, well, once we're all dead, then people are... <laughs> and then Dave Grohl was talking about them recently. And so it's, it's kind of strange because it's like, on the one hand, we'd all, our little gang of mates that would to do with it will always say oh well yeah one day one day they one day they'll get it and now it's sort of happening and so it's, yeah, yeah. it's kind of amazing really i mean what was really cool is about two or three years ago he got he got made a doctor of music yeah and that was really really beautiful it was a, a really beautiful thing, thing thing to happen and what was so nice was that and it, and it was it must have i mean we used to talk about it a bit 
But if you think from, from Tim's perspective, all these years, and, and, you know, one thing about Tim, he was a modest guy and, you know, he was a very kind of easygoing guy, but he knew how good his stuff was. You know, he didn't not know. You know, he knew just how fucking special his music was. I mean, he'd never, he'd never say, oh, my stuff, but he knew, he knew how fucking good this music was, you know, and how yeah. important it was, and which is why he kept on doing it. And so to, to the, the kind of vitriol and nastiness that he would get from the music press, because, because everybody knew that. Anyone who knows about kind of, I mean, maybe it's just music for people who are wired up funny, I don't know. But most people I know, you kind of get how important this music is. So that comes back to what I was saying earlier about um, no, I don't, no one genre has exclusivity over like genius and visionary. Because I mean, the right. thing is, yeah, the the world, the world is thankfully because with some shitty humans in the world, but the world is blessed by visionaries. And presumably, if you are a, a visionary, you are going to make your vision out of the language that you're surrounded with so if the only language you're surrounded with you've grown up with is jazz you're not going to make a fucking prog record you're going to make a, a, a fucking jazz record and it's the, if the only language you're surrounded with is comic books but you're a visionary then you're going to be you know you're going to be like you know um you're going to create like a genius comic and if you're going to and, and so i don't like this the, the, the very idea that somehow people who grew up on a diet of metal couldn't then make visionary metal you know it's, it's just ridiculous and it's it's not so much now now that like i said now that rock and roll's all over people can the <laughs> dust has settled on it and people can examine it but there was a time maybe because now everybody knows that black sabbath is a fucking righteous band you know everybody knows that the, those aussie albums are like just absolute yeah. but for a while people just thought like black this what can you do so that you know, but actually just something you said you, you said earlier reminds me what you were saying about the clash do you know there's there's some bands and you might be able to think of some more but you know there are a few bands that you're not allowed to quite like you have to be all in and and i'll tell you that for instance one of them is the velvet underground now i quite like i quite like the velvet underground same here same here and people say, you know i quite like can what do you think of Can? Yeah, I, I quite like them. No, no, no you've got your, you know, and then Joy Division. You know, I, I, I quite, I quite like Joy. What do you think of Joy Division? Yeah, I quite like them. You know, you know, they're yeah. not Celtic Frost. You know, it's I, I quite like them. <laughs> Stooges, Stooges. I, you know, I quite like the Stooges. Yeah, I like, I like all that stuff. There's no way of quantifying. You know, to me, it's all just interesting, good music. Whether yeah. it's Can or Celtic Frost or the Velvet Underground. I can find something in all that stuff. It's weird when people start inventing rules about why they can and can't like something, you know? Yeah. I, don't, I never really understand. And I think I understand that might be because when you're a young person, you're like staking out your identity and, you know, what you like is really important. And I like this, so I'm this kind of person and you're that kind of person and this and that, whatever. Um, and you know after a while it's just like well you know i'll just like whatever i like i don't really care about how it's perceived or how it's you know if you like anything that you think is good it's good you know yeah, like, yeah. oh pharaoh sanders karma i like that record yeah, oh, yeah. The, the um loaded by velvet underground i like that record too you know if you like it you like it and, and um yeah, yeah. I, but i think you know, I it's it's all changed because we I mean when we grew up you used to music was there to define yourself by. Yes. But I was and I, I I only say this that the rock and roll thing is all over because I was walking my dog yesterday uh with a friend and we went past these two girls that must have been about I suppose thirteen or fourteen and one was wearing a uh the cure t shirt. And yes. the other one was wear and the other one was wearing a Prince Purple Rain t shirt. Yes. And I was thinking God, do you know what? That would be like me when I was 14, wearing a like uh, a Bill Haley in the Comets t-shirt or something. Or even, yeah, even earlier, even earlier. Yeah, because it's, it's it's 40 so years ago. ago. And it's so long ago, and I was thinking, you, you you wouldn't even want to be... I mean, back in those days, you wouldn't even wear a Rolling Stones t-shirt. If, if if I was in town and someone was wearing a Rolling Stones t-shirt, it's like, the fuck are you wearing that for, you know? <laughs> you guys at the end... But now that the now that the story is over with rock and roll, people can pick their favorite period and go, "Oh, well, the Cure and the, or the Prince," because because it no longer defines people. But, but it used to just totally, you know, it, it would be 
I mean, music was just, it, it, well, it still is everything, but it was, it was everything around music as well. So I yeah. can't work out whether, think, whether it's better now or worse. I think it's probably better that people define themselves more, maybe more by their politics now or something. But for me growing up, I mean, music and politics were kind of the same thing anyway. It was just, if you're into, if you were buying into that, then y your whole philosophy was, was, was part of that, you know. But, sure, sure, sure. Does that make any sense? Sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but um No, no, you're not rambling. Um yeah, well there's nothing at stake anymore. You know, I'm old enough now. I forget how old I am, you know, I forget that I'm an old person, although I just I feel the same, which is the big <laughs> joke about <laughs> so which is the, yeah. that that's like the big joke about getting older. You realize, oh, your grandparents were still the, are still the same people they ever were. Yeah. I'm still yeah, the yeah. same person I ever am. I'm just gonna keep getting older till I die. And that's just yeah. I know how it is, and I'm still the same person. But when I was younger, you know, music, it seemed like um, before rock and roll died, like you said, um, there were less things to do. Like, yeah, you could be yeah. into sports, you could be into music, you could read books or whatever. And now with the, um, the internet culture, and I'm not knocking the internet culture because, you know, there's a lot of great things about it, as well as not so great things, of course, but... Um, nostalgia has caught up with everything and i i would say since since uh 2000 it's it's over you know like there, there's there's in the 80s there was uh you know new wave of british heavy metal punk rock whatever blah 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 alternative rock they used to call it college rock here in the states college rock that's what they called things like uh rem and uh, the replacements when they started to get popular and then yeah, later yeah. when when husker do made their jump to a major label and, and dinosaur jr it was called college rock yeah and in the 90s what happened in the 90s well it was grunge and uh green day offspring all that punk commercialized punk rock that could sell lots of records and i know there's something else rap music i guess and and the, I mean, the, the 90s was more uh, what was kind of cool about the 90s was there was that whole sort of post kind of slint stuff happening like tortoise and then like you know tune of 44 and all yeah, yeah. and then like fucking champs do you remember those guys and um, yeah i knew, I knew old polvo and all that so there was there was like that was i was it i was in polvo you were in polvo i played on uh well they had like they had three drummers in their career and i was the second drummer i replaced their <laughs> i replaced their uh main drummer eddie and they brought me in to play on this record called Shapes that everybody hated when it came out. Yeah, I don't know it. And, so. Yeah, well, yeah. Then they broke up for 10 years and got back together with my roommate. But yeah, I, I, I used to love Polo. It's not really important that I was in Polo. I, you just brought it right. <laughs> No, but no, you, you have to mention it, man, you know. But yeah, for yeah. me, then there was uh, the 90s was, um, and then also in the UK, for, there was some really, really brilliant explosion of sort of electronic music. And the, well, I was lucky to move to London at the time when the whole jungle thing was happening and to be living here in Hackney where it was kind of exploding from. So, yeah. it, and for me, like, well, not just drum and bass, but that whole, the whole kind of stuff that came from like Warp Records, like Orteca and I suppose Aphex Twin and Square Pusher, this... Yeah seemed to my ears to be completely connected with what Voivod was doing, what Shudder Think were doing, what Cardiacs were doing. It seemed like the electronic wing of, of that. So it actually yeah. seemed like a really, a really big deal. So I kind of, all that kind of, I mean, I was aware that on the, on the larger stage, there was things like Blink-182 or, you know, Korn or th those sort of bands. I was aware right, that right. was going on, but it was it was this kind of, and, and also living in London, because I, I grew up in Plymouth, which was a kind of cultural dead spot, just to move to London and just to have all this stuff going on, you know, having grown up with music and have this fucking mental music going on the whole way. I didn't, it wasn't really until, you, you know, I did, it wasn't really until I became a dad, I think, or until the until things went down with Cardiacs and Tim, and and Tim went down that I really stopped and looked back and thought, oh, well, what's what's going on with music? You know, I, I sort of it, it just seemed to be a mad kind of swirl of crazy stuff always coming yeah. out. So that now you can go back. You can. It's all about. It's almost like refinement now. Is that now it's okay for a, a, a band in their twenties to go back and pick a period in in music? Like they might go, oh, I'm going to pick the 
you know, sort of post-punk period, and to take a bit from Pill and to take a bit from, um, you know, Joy Division, and then put a little bit of, I don't know, like the pop group on top of that. And then Gang that's of the four. band that they are. Gang, so of, Gang four. of Four. Kind of like, Gang of Four was the most them. ripped off. Gang of Four were the most ripped off band in our country for five years straight. Everybody that came out okay. to see this yeah, game, yeah. it's like there was, this, it was before they got back together. What was an interesting change for me is that if you'd have done that in the, um, uh, you know, if you'd have done that in the 80s when music was still sort of progressing, you would have got pilloried for it. You know, you would, I remember there was a band that came out in the 80s called Kingdom Come and they kind of ripped off Led Zeppelin. This I, rem I, remember, I remember them. Remember them and they got fucking buried for it. Whereas now yeah. it's like, oh no, no, we just, no, there's no Led Zeppelin. We can be the band that's, I mean, it's just sort of, diff I don't know if you're, um, well, here's an example. Are you a, do you, are you a fan of XTC at all? Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, um, all I really know by them is that Waxworks record and all oh, those yeah, early yeah, singles. Yeah, singles um, thing, yeah. I, I've heard, but I've heard other stuff, but um, I do like them, but I haven't investigated them as much as I probably should, but I do know about them. Well, in, in, the mid, <clears throat> in the mid 80s, they released these two albums under the name The Dukes of Stratosphere. And they're amazing, by the way. But what it was is that they just they um, they recorded these two albums in the style of like 60s psychedelic, like a really good 60s psychedelic band. Um, and they changed their names. They released it as under the name of Dukes of Stratosphere and didn't tell anyone. I remember about that. XTC. And yeah. then and, and, you know, and it really is amazing. It's like they've taken all the best bits of psychedelia. These two albums are fantastic. And then, of course, people cottoned on, oh, right, it's XTC, and then they, they put their hands up and said, yeah, that's us. But I was just thinking that if, if that band had come out nowadays, they could just call themselves Dukes of Stratosphere and be like that and not pretend to be, not have to hide what they were. It's, it's kind of cool. You can just pick your period and go, yep, I want to be a, a 1966 to 1968 British beat, sort of freak beat band or whatever, and then just copy that stuff without any influences coming in from beyond that. And people are just like, yeah, that's cool, because rock and roll stopped progressing. And it's, it's, not, it, it's over now. So I don't know if it's good or bad. I mean, it might be good. It might be good that people are taking things that were done before and trying to make them better. I don't know. You were, you were talking about how people reference things from 40 years ago. And can you imagine people referencing music from 40 years before the Beatles? I know, it just shows I know, how much, obviously. yeah. It just shows how much time has has passed. Where like you know you were talking about seeing the person, the young lady that had um, a Cure shirt, um, and how weird that is. You know, like when I listen to the Cure, I don't think, well, seventeen seconds is forty years ago. I just think this is just another record I like. But yeah, the idea of referencing something from that long ago. If you go even farther back, like beyond before the Beatles came out, or before, it's like, that's crazy. It is crazy. And um, well, I mean, uh, but I, I remember buying a Pearl Express record on the day it came out, and it struck me the other day that we are further away from Pony Express record than we were from Sergeant Pepper's at the time that came out. You know, and Sergeant Pepper's just yeah. like ages ago. You know, it was because before my time, before I was born. So you know. I was uh, one year old or two years old or something like that. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't have any answers, but I agree. It's very strange. No, I don't. I mean, I, and I'm not. I'm really not here to say things were better in the old days. Or I mean, I, I don't know whether they're that they're, they're, they're better or not. I mean, in a way, it's kind of from my perspective from making music is I, I i kind of feel the pressures off now that i don't feel like i'm gonna to have to change the world it's like you know i sort of you wanted you wanted my music to change the world and of course you know no music's going to change the world least of all mine so now it's pressure off i can sort of do anything you, know, you can so. do whatever you want um but thanks a lot for uh for talking to me this went far better than i thought it, it ever could considering we've never <laughs> met or whatever so you know I just had this feeling, just based on everything you've commented on my stuff. And okay, he likes Shudder to Think, Voivod. He has this arsenal history of music, and he was in cardiacs. I think there's no way I, this is going to not go well, and it we, did. So, thank. We didn't even. So thank we didn't you even get on, 
we didn't even get onto Melvin's or comics, you know, comic books. You know, that could have been a, that could have been a whole other. <laughs> well, the Melvins, I met them in 1986. And they were just like, in 1986, out of the world I came out of, which is like, you know, punk rock, hardcore, or, or that version of it. Um, all the big bands from the early 80s in the States had broken up or gone off on a tangent, like Black Flag was gone. They were a band that almost broke up in time, as far as I'm concerned. Dead Candies were gone. Um, and people were just sick of million miles an hour hardcore. At that point, people from my generation. So it was kind of like, you know, times were changing, whatever. And I read about the Melvins and Maximum Rock and Roll, which was like this big punk rock fanzine that yeah. came out of San Francisco. That You used to be able to buy that in the UK, in the independent record shops would sell it in the UK as well. Yeah. Well, they were like, I mean, I don't know what, they're, what, what they ended up being like, but when they first came out, they were a very pivotal main, I mean, it, it came out in like 1982, 83, 84, 85. So everything up until that point, things weren't quite as regimented. So there was actually a big variety. But a couple of years later, you know, the rot had set in and, you know, it was, it was, it was just over, you know, it was just over. And then the Melvins came out and they were like some of the first people, I mean, not really, but, um, you know, punk metal can't get along or whatever and and uh whatever people thought their their allegiances to whatever and they came out with this really slow music that enraged the punkers in the audience but they were really good you know it was like they were like the next step you know clearly they were the next step and everybody fucking hated them and you know over the last 30 years they just kept at it and they just turned people around to to liken them and um you know they started putting out records and people started to like them but at first nobody liked them i mean yeah. they, were, they were hated i mean they were kind of popular in the pacific northwest before they moved to san francisco but it's such a weird period you know like uh staying with them and dale playing having a videotape of him playing drums in nirvana way before any of that stuff happened and just watching it going well, Dale's a great drummer, but this stuff's okay. And just, you know, I again I, I just I just couldn't pick it. You know, I I, I wasn't like watching it, watching it going, whoa, this stuff is really great. This is gonna take over the universe. I mean, nobody would have thought that. It was just a fluke. I, I gotta say, just as, as an aside, I was really glad when they did though. I was really glad when Nirvana was like the biggest band on the planet, because it was like, well, fair enough, it's a good band, you know. It's it's rare it's rare yeah. that I could say that. <laughs> Oh, about Nirvana? About well, yeah, when they were. I mean, if you know, when they, you know, I, I, I wish it could have been Voivod or Cardiacs, but fair play, it was Nirvana. I mean, it could have been a lot worse, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, I, I, I mean, thought he was, I thought he was a great songwriter and a great singer, and he looked fantastic. I mean, that's just an aside, but um. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I, I can't say that. I think I was too old to really be like, whoa. But fair enough. A lot of his songs were good. Timing, right place, right time. He had a cool yeah, voice. Yeah. He wrote good songs, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a weird yeah. time, though. But I tell you, my my the way I got turned on, because it's funny you say about no people um, digging them, because I, I knew of Melvin's, because I kind of liked, I was not massively, but I had kind of lots of people where I grew up were really into that whole sub-pop thing. So it was, it was like Green River and the, you know, kind of throw ups and um tad and i was really into tad actually and mud honey and i knew melvin's was like something to do with that at least in the uk i know they really weren't but you'd hear their name in association sure and i used to i used to, i used to go and buy promo records there's a record shop in plymouth called rival records and i'd get loads of promos and they, the guys would just sell these promos off and um the, this guy was just going through his promos and one of them was gluey porch treatments and he said oh you like weird music don't you you'll like this and that was my that was my way in and i i still think for me it's the it's the metal tramp mask replica i think it's it's absolutely one of the greatest albums of all time i think it's, i agree I think it's definitely i think it's definitely the greatest debut of any band it, and and for what i love about this record 
And this is, I've got to put myself in the position of presumably with those guys, they grew up always wanting to, you know, like we all do, always wanting to put a record out. Yes. I love, you know, usually on your first album, you know, you're going to put in your, you put, put forward your, your strongest champion to get people in. Because you never know, well, this might be the only chance I ever get to make a record. This might be the only yes. record, record I make. Put forward the best champion. And I love that glue portrait treatments for the first two or three minutes. Just, just nothing, just feedback. And yeah. then finally... The drums come in. Yeah. And then out of this mad soup, for after a few minutes, finally... And it's like the balls on that for your first album to make people wait that long. Because some people must have just gone, oh, fuck this, you know. And then, I lay like you, finally. And this mad song lurches out of it. And it's, for me, it, that was when I was just like, oh, hang on a minute. You, just conceptually, I just thought the balls of these guys, young kids on their first album to, to open with that. Because it could have been, who knows what would have happened. Maybe that would be the only record they made, you know. But And, and really, hey, people... Hey. People didn't like that record that I used to play it to. It would really fucking... I mean, some people loved it, but some people just, they did not like it at all, you know. And, and made people angry. I, I had the same yeah, experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would play it for people and they would just be like, what the fuck is this, you know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. It goes back to what I was saying about thinking, well, anybody that likes music is going to like this. This is, this is yeah, terrific yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the reaction you get, it's almost like when you... Um, when sometimes people get into punk rock or whatever and they're really excited about it and they're like have this fervor check it out and it's like and people are just like this is garbage and you're like what what are you talking about that's glowy porch is still sort of my favorite elvin's record just because yeah, it's too, yeah. because it's the first one <laughs> we've got we've gotten into an hour and 11 minutes so i'm gonna i'm gonna let you go all right yeah <laughs> fair enough yeah yeah but hey, this is this was really great. Um, is if people want to get this is your chance to uh, before I let you go. If there's anything you want to say as far as like, hey, if you want to check out my stuff, go here. And then what I'll do is I'll take a picture of a screenshot of that page and I'll flash it on the interview. Okay. Um, if people are interested in checking out all your various project uh, projects, where do they go? um well oh god well they're all they're all splatter all over the place um right. my my projects include um my band knife world the recent gong albums the last couple of guapo records but also if you wanted a way in oh, a, a band called the utopia strong but also a, as a way in i put out a solo album last year and i'm as happy called hip to the jag which you can get on my yes. Bandcamp page and just go and listen to it i'm as happy with that as anything i've ever made so um Okay, well then I'll I'll I will put a a flash on the screen of the Bandcamp page and uh, yeah, and yeah. that's just my name, Carlos Tarabi, just under that name. So yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Well, it's been really nice to well, meet you. Well, this has been really nice. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for. Uh, I want to say I'm a real fan of your art. I got turned on to it. Do you know a guy? Just quickly, do you know a guy called Jimmy Martin that plays an angel witch now? An angel witch? You know that guy? He, he, he's, he's the new. He, he plays an angel witch now. Um, no, but I love I love that first angel witch record. That's one of my favorite new wave of British heavy metal records of all time. Oh, okay. Well, th th he's uh, he turned me on to your artwork. He sent me um, oh. he sent me a nothing face era picture, and then it, someone else sent me the cardiac one you did of the the rotten shed. So I've I'm a, I've been a big fan of your art. I wanted to say, but um, oh well, thank thanks a lot. I appreciate much. it. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, um...